stop you and just explain that thing you can stop me or anyone anytime when you need some explanation okay that's that's for everyone anyone who needs any clarification explanation when anyone is speaking can just raise the hand or can just interrupt and stop uh, there's no problem with that so anyone who would like to um, <clears throat> give a quick summary that will also help me So we started with microbes in human welfare. If no one will give a summary, then I'll take it because I also have to explain in between a few things. <clears throat> no one would like to volunteer. It's a, it's a very easy chapter, people. You can just stand up and summarize. It's for your benefit only. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll summarize. Uh, yes, Atif. Thank you so much. Let's let's go. Sir, can you please wait for me trying to set up something? Yes. <clears throat> please excuse me for uh, my in between cuffs today. It's all right, sir. So, okay, sir. So, Atif, whenever you are ready. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, yeah, now the chapter we're learning right now is uh, microbes in human welfare. We start mm -hmm. the chapter by listing some uh, good microbes, such as uh, lactobacillus, which is responsible for the curdling of milk, and probiotics, uh, which are present in intestine and are generally good bacteria for us. Then yeast, that is also known as Baker's yeast. Uh, the scientific name is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It is uh, responsible for the, responsible for, for, it is needed for uh, making bread and also for processes involving fermentation and so, and so on. Um, then we learned about the microbes in, uh, then we learned about the microbes in household products. First, we started with lactic acid bacteria. A very good example is lactobacillus. And lactic lactobacillus produces lactic acid, which is responsible for the curdling of milk. As lact lactic acid coagulates the proteins in milk. And the benefit of curd over milk is that it increases uh, its nutritional value. Uh, it increases the vitamin B12. Then we learned about other bacteria such as uh, the, one, the ones responsible for making cheese like uh, Propioni bacterium charmani. Uh, yeah, so ju just one just one thing, Aratif. Uh, okay, sir. So in, in curd, the nutritional value is high because when you say it increases, it means that milk already had those vitamins. So oftentimes pasteurized milk where there is no bacterial growth have do not have uh, vitamin B12 complex, it comes over the time with these lactic acid bacteria growing and producing these molecules. Okay, so they act like probiotic bacteria, the good bacteria in the gut. So it's present in yogurts and curd and not necessarily in the amount, significant amount in milk. Okay. Okay. Yeah, continue. Yes, um, then, yeah, we learned about Propioni bacteria and Charmani, which, which, which is used for making Swiss cheese. And the holes in Swiss cheese are due to the production of carbon dioxide by this bacteria. Then we learned about Roquefort cheese, which is used to, which is uh, made with the help of a fungi. The fungi grows on cheese and this uh, produces the flavor of the cheese. Yep. Yeah, then we learned about microbes in industrial products. Uh, the first one we learned about is uh, Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae. Uh, this is used in the production of lots of uh, be beverages such as uh, alcohol and I also believe in some fruit juices. Then we learned yeah. about, yeah, then um, I think we learned about an antibiotics, which are chemical substances that 
are produced by microbes that okay, that kill germs. So the first uh, antibiotics they discovered is penicillin. So this was discovered by Alexander Fleming, who, who worked on Staphylococcus bacteria, and he he discovered that it uh, the Staphylococcus did not grow around the mold ca containing a fungi known as uh, Penicillium notatum. And yeah, so he extracted the penicillin from this penicillin notator. And finally, Ernest Stein and Howard Florey, two scientists, uh, they established the full potential of this uh, penicillin and they produced effective antibiotics. So due to this uh, discovery that saved many lives, these three scientists, uh, Fleming, Chain, Florey, they were awarded the Nobel Prize. Yeah, and I think, uh, I'm not wrong, they got it in 1945 after the Second World War. 65. Okay. Is, is it 65? No, I don't think it's 65. I think uh, I'm sure it was before 50s, if I'm not wrong. Can anyone check? It's 1945. 45, right? Mm -hmm. Because, yes, yeah. Research. Yes. So in 1945, they received the Nobel for synthesizing antibiotic from for figuring out the first antibiotic is the and the story associated with this was that how this discovery happened. So it was not a deliberate discovery. Uh, Alexander Fleming was not working with penicillium, penicillium notatum. The spores of penicillium notatum just landed on his bacterial culture plates. He was working with Staphylococcus bacteria. Uh, so he was a microbiologist doing something with the bacteria. I'm not, very, I'm not I don't know what he was working on at that time. When he left some of the culture plates <clears throat> in, in the open, space. Maybe he just wanted to discard it because something didn't run, but he had bacterial colonies on that on that plate. And he saw that uh, something started growing on those plates from one side, which I have shown here in red. And this was a mold. Mold means it belonged to fungi. And this fungi, wherever it was growing, the bacterial colonies in its vicinity, uh, there was no bacteria. So it killed all the bacteria in its vicinity. Only bacterial colonies which were away at the different edge of the plates were present few. So he realized that this particular organism, which is growing, is causing something that is not allowing the bacteria to grow. So he realized that uh, this is penicillium notatum, a fungi which is growing upon uh, observations. And later on, it was figured out that it secretes a chemical known as penicillin, named as penicillin, because on the, on the basis of the name of the fungi itself. Okay, and then uh, this was first antibacterial agent discovered from the nature. And then later on, Ernest Chain and Howard Florey took up this discovery and started uh, making an uh, applicative use of it by... Good evening, sir. Good evening, Aisha, good evening. We're just discussing what we did yesterday, okay? <clears throat> my, my, my throat is not very well today, so please bear with me. It's so, right, sir. I actually wanted to say something. When you said about the dandruff, so I searched about it and I came to know basically dandruff is a bad microbe. And its name starts with something M. It's not present in Shanghai. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, so I was just I was just telling that uh, how Alexander Fleming and then Ernest Chain and Howard Florey produced effective antibiotic from penicillin. So penicillin is, it's a biological substance released, okay, by this fungi, released. It's not very new. Let me also tell you that it's not very unique with penicillium notatum. In nature, plants, fungi, even animals, they produce certain things, even bacteria, they produce certain toxins. It's called toxin, biological toxin, to get rid of or to outcompete other Okay, so in nature, it's a wild, it's a very brutal competition of survival. So wherever this fungi grows, it is the optimum temperature and the optimum conditions for many other bacteria to also grow. Let's, so let's say this fungi is growing on something dead and decaying. So many bacteria will also start growing there. And then they will also compete with this fungi for nutrition. So over time in nature, it started secreting something that damages. So what, how penicillin works is it, it degrades, it damages the cell wall of the bacteria. And if a bacteria uh, 
bacteria's cell wall is damaged, then the bacteria will not be able to survive. So you kill your competitors so that you can get all the nutrition and resources in that region. It is done by uh, many plants, animals, and organisms, okay, in nature. So luckily, this, they just figured out that for many bacterial strains, this penicillin works because many bacterial strains, almost like bacteria have a cell wall, which is made up of peptidoglycan, right? So it works, so antibiotics still works. <clears throat> but I also told you that uh, microbes are getting resistant and I ask you to go back and read about horizontal gene transfer in bacteria. <clears throat> Did you do that? people did anyone go back and read about horizontal gene transfer in bacteria if not please 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 do that okay it's to make you understand the concepts better so is this part clear the doubt was asked yes sir, it's clear now okay okay shine yes atif would you like to continue from the would you like to continue with the last part Yes, sir. Um, then we learned about uh, organic acid producing microbes. So we learned about some examples. The first one we learned was uh, acetic acid, which is produced by a bacteria named uh, Acetobacter aceti. Then we learned about citric acid produced by a fungus known as uh, Aspergillus niger. Niger or niger, I'm not sure. Then we produced... Yeah, then... yeah you can... So, so, so these names, uh, as you know, that names do not have proper nouns, do not have any one fixed pronunciation, right? So people call me Rahul, some, someone from the West will call me Rahul. It's okay. It's okay because they are proper nouns. We call Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton. It's, it's all okay. But it's Aspergillus niger. Even if you say Aspergillus niger, it's, it's not a big deal. Fungi and fungi, people say this. It's okay. I don't think you have to be grammar Nazi for names or proper nouns. Okay, sir. Yeah, yeah. so citric acid <laughs> is produced by a fungus known as Aspergillus niger. Uh, then we learned about lactic acid, which we as we learned before is produced by a bacteria known as uh, Lactobacillus. And finally, we butyric acid, which is produced by a bacteria known as um, <laughs> Clostridium uh, butylicum. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, butylicum. Yes, so these were organic acid producing microbes and organic acid is a very important component or industries because many things, including our food products, preservatives, and a lot of cleaning, cleansing agents are made up of these organic acids. Okay. Now, continuing with, with bacteria, which are used in industries, we did chemicals. Now let's go to some bioactive molecules and enzyme producing bacteria, okay, in the same series. So thank you so much, Atif, for giving the summary. So today I'll be telling you about some more applications of microbes, especially in the field of medicine and, and, and therapeutics. Now, uh, I have told you all about, so you know about, uh, heart attack right what leads to a cardiac arrest or a heart attack anyone so yes donna before we move further on could you tell yeah. the difference between distilled and non-distilled alcohol yeah yes I, I gave you i gave that as a homework as well right yeah. so uh, anyone has figured out what is let me go up yes this one so distilled and non-distilled alcohol are they both produced through the same fermentation process or not? Anyone figured out before I go and <clears throat> describe it? So non-distilled is also known as undistilled. So what is distillation? Let's say distillation is a process you have studied, I think. Yes, Aisha. Sir, I did. Basically, um, you can just tell me what is distillation or what is, yeah, yes, sorry. So you are asking something? 
Now I was saying, what what is what do we mean by distillation? Or dis, when I say something is distilled or something is not distilled, it's basically uh, like uh, the separation. Uh -huh. Um, like for example, if we see water or beverage, so many things are there. Like, um, I want nature. I know. Like, pro it's the process of uh, separating the compounds. Uh, yeah, yes, like sedimentation is uh, also a process. By condensation and holding and all right. Yes, you're, you're right, but let me put it in a proper words. So you are right. Uh, you, you're not just to the point, but you, uh, I understood what you're saying. So by distillation, you can actually uh, separate two liquids which are mixed together. Not immiscible, but miscible liquids. And on what, so whenever we, we can dis, uh, distinguish or separate two Mixable mixed liquids from each other. What property can we utilize? So one property that can that uh, can be utilized is their boiling points. Different liquids have different boiling points. Correct. So water boils at hundred degrees Celsius. We know that. Yes, everyone. Yes. For, yes, sir. yes. For alcohols, it's it's less than that. Or for something which is, um, for example. Um, some other liquid, let's say, which is not water, not alcohol, for that it might be something else. So if there is a difference in the in the boiling point, then we can evaporate, heat the mixture at a particular boiling point, the first boiling point, which is lower for, so only that liquid from that mixture will evaporate because that liquid's boiling point has reached. When it will evaporate, it will become gaseous. Now we will not allow that gas to escape. We will collect it and then, through a bent tube. So there's a structure that you have. So this is how it is done. So there's a big beaker on fire here and there's a mixed liquid. So suppose you reach 90 degrees Celsius. This is a boiling point of an alcohol where water, water will not boil. Water will just be heated but will not start boiling and evaporating. So only alcohol will start rising. So this tube will go up and will bend with some space here. And then again, there will be another container. So what happens is this vapors will go up and start condensing because here we will put a condenser condensing or you can also use running water. When it will condense, what will get collected here is that liquid which has 90 degrees as its point of evaporation. You understand? So that's distillation. Now we know that alcohol is readily, it's miscible in water or immiscible in water. It's immiscible. It's miscible. It can be mixed in water. Okay, that's where that's why that's how people can dilute um, alcohol by mixing it with water. Okay, so utilizing this property, a distilled means where alcohol has been separated. So all distilled alcoholic beverages, okay, they contain more alcohol by volume than the undistilled drinks. Okay. Is it clear, people? Yes, sir. So, for yes, example, uh, rum is a distilled spirit along with vodka. So, uh, distilled liquor, for example, whiskey, rum, brandy. Or br brandy yes, brandy. They are all uh, distilled because they have high alcohol volume. Sometimes going up to forty in absolute vodka, it can be you know sixty percent uh, volume of percent volume of alcohol, for example, but on the other hand, alcohols like beer, alcoholic beverages like beer, which are fermented, but only contains four to 5% of alcohol by volume, which means rest 95% or 96% is just water. Okay. So that's distilled and non-distilled. Now, what do you think where in which fermentation, uh, more fermentation has happened in distilled or in non-distilled? What do you think? To make, yeah, to make a, a distilled or an undistilled, we need more fermentation. Uh, to uh, to make distilled, I guess. Yes, because you need to fermentation will lead to production of alcohol. But let me give you. Uh, let me also tell you a 
quick interesting fact you know the 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 yeast which is saccharomyces cerevisiae when they start producing alcohol in during fermentation if that alcohol concentration in that solution reaches more than 13% so if the alcohol concentration reaches more than 13% it will start killing the fungi itself so these saccharomyces cerevisiae will not will start dying so can you can you now think why is distilled how can we make distilled beverages how can we make beverages with 25% 30% alcohol content by distillation process right so whenever it's uh, around 10 or 11% you just distill that and collect it separately that will decrease the concentration of alcohol in that solution and will allow saccharomyces cerevisiae to do more fermentation in the same solution then whenever it reaches another next 10% again distill it and and uh, separate it you understand do you understand people yes sir yes so beyond beyond 13% saccharomyces cerevisiae cannot keep producing alcohol it becomes toxic to they, themselves so you can just write down undistilled alcohol is beer champagne port and distilled one is gin whiskey brandy vodka rum okay sir, okay very well yeah can sorry asha can i ask one thing yes wine comes in uh, what you are saying distilled or undistilled beverage wine yeah yeah so wine uh, is also undistilled because there also the alcohol content is low if it is less than 13% we don't need to distill it right we can produce any alcohol which is less than 13% by just one batch of fermented fermentation we do not need to distill and separate it yes or no yes sir yeah so uh, let's say you want uh, the company wants to or the industry wants to make a beer which is a uh, standard 4.5% alcohol by volume so when the amount reaches 4.5% you will either uh, remove these uh, yeast or kill these yeast and separate the alcohol and then you just let it age you must have heard that the the older the alcohol is the better it is right sometimes they they let it age so alcohol alcoholic drinks has uh, are aged for very very long times in wooden barrels correct so yes. that is to let it age very slowly with very slow uh, fermentation happening in a controlled environment so less than 13% we can make so that's all those are all uh, undistilled if you have to go beyond that then you have to utilize use the distillation process otherwise you cannot make it okay is it is it clear or no yes sir oh it was was it asked by shahin no okay i think the doubt was asked by dona right between distilled and non distilled yes sir okay is it clear shall i move forward yes, okay so today so as i was saying uh, let's talk about some other microbes that play a very important role in giving us some the substances or i should say bioactive compounds which are helped in medicine as well so there is one such substance called streptokinase and again if the name is is at the end what do you think it is as a molecule which biological molecule it is whatever in the end if you have is it is a an enzyme okay lipase protease amylase these are all common enzymes in your digestive system yes or no yes sir yes, you understand people okay so similarly streptokinase carbonic anhydrase or uh, hydrolase every ase is an enzyme so uh, streptokinase is secreted or is produced from the bacterium streptococcus 
Okay. Now, what does it tell you about the bacteria? It's Streptococcus. So it's a genus. Coccus means they are cocci shaped. What do we mean by cocci shaped? Spherical shaped. Yes, they are spherical shaped that live in group, like a bunch of grapes. So one streptococcus that we studied in the last chapter, chapter eight, which is harmful for us is, anyone remembers? A streptococcus bacteria that we studied in uh, disease, human health and disease chapter, which we did it not like. Pneumonia. Perfect, it caused pneumonia. So here it also it's streptococcus, but this particular strain we are using to get streptokinase from this. And this streptokinase is a genetically engineered product. So we have to genetically engineer the bacteria. What do I mean by genetic engineering is, we tweak with genetics. It's very easy to add a gene or to remove a gene from a bacteria uh, or to express a gene in the bacteria. All you need to do, and that's why I ask you to go back and read about a horizontal gene transfer. Bacteria, we can send a gene inside a bacteria very easily and that bacteria will express that gene and produce the protein from that gene if it is a protein coding gene that they normally do in nature. So we just utilize the same ability of them and make them express the genes and the pro make uh, the proteins that we need for our benefit. One of that is streptokinase. So it's a genetically engineered um, gene and it is used as a clot buster. So clot buster is many a times uh, there are clots due to cholesterol or other things, emboli, which happens in the heart on the blood vessels okay so this condition is called myocardial infarction if there is a clot in the blood vessels in the heart it's called myocardial now you can understand the word the word myo means myology myoglobin myocyte myo means muscle and the word cardiac means heart so heart muscle infarction so word infarction means injury or death death due to loss of oxygen uh, sorry a lack of oxygen is, is ischemic or infarct infarction myocardial infarction so this condition whenever myocardial infarction happens it can lead to heart attack because heart starts dying and suddenly it can just stop that is called heart attack will stop beating and the person will suddenly just get into a um, unconscious state and then will die okay so to prevent this and to help people or patients who have high risk of myocardial infarction because they have clots in their blood vessels okay uh, right blood vessels of heart so to remove that clot, you give something which is known as streptokinase as an injection, which is a clot buster, okay? It dissolves that clot. It also makes the blood a little thinner, but it will help the patient to survive. So this is one. Is it clear, everyone, streptokinase? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. An another is cyclosporin, okay? Cyclosporin A, basically. So cyclosporin A is an immunosuppressant. It suppresses the immune system. Now, why would we like to suppress our own immune system? I taught you something in chapter eight where you can relate this. Immunosuppressant, it actually suppresses the immune system. Why would you like your immune system to be suppressed and not active? It's a good thing for us, right? Immunosuppression uh, can be used in the case of like organ transplants. Yes, perfect. Immunity. Why, why, why it is used in organ transplant? What's the problem with organ transplantation? Atif, if you would, if you would like to shed some light on it, 
What did we study? Yes, so the cell mediated Im cell mediated immunity in the body can only differentiate between self and non self. So no matter what our foreign party, yeah, no matter what our foreign particle enters our body, you know, it's like about to help us. For example, during like a let's say a heart transplant, if you like transplant another like another person's heart into our body, the body will recognize it as non self and attack it even if it's there to help us. So in this case, we have to like. A suppress the immune system to prevent this from happening. Exactly. So Atif has he perfectly uh, explained, and just to just to reiterate what he said a little more clearly is, uh, immunosuppressants are given in the condition where we do not need our own immune system to reject the non-self tissue that we have transplanted, because the immune system is developed in a way where it only focuses on self versus non-self. If the tissue is a non-self tissue, our immune system will kill it. But when we transplant something like a kidney, part of the liver or a heart or any other organ, we do not want our own body to kill that organ because it's coming from some other person. In that case, you are given immunosuppressant. The patient is given immunosuppressant. So cyclosporin A is one such immunosuppressant that is given to patients. Okay. Given in case of organ transplants. Otherwise the organ or the tissue will get rejected. Now this bioactive molecule cyclosporin A is produced by a fungus. Okay, so it is produced from, it's called trichoderma polysporum. Trichoderma polysporum. Okay. And it's a fungi or a fungus. Another important biochemical, bi bioactive molecule is called statins. Anyone has heard of statins anywhere? What are statins? So does it like uh, inhibit? So it can drugs, I think. I think so, I'm not sure. Yeah, all of them are drugs. Cyclosporin A. A drug is just a chemical molecule that we send in our body to help us with something. That's a drug. Yeah. All your medicines are drugs. All the non-medicated hallucinogens are drug. No, all I, the... I guess it's related to cholesterol, this one. Yes, perfect. So if anyone... Uh, if anyone around you or you know in the family or as friends who are suffering or who, whose parents are suffering from high cholesterol levels. So if someone has high blood cholesterol, they need, so cholesterol are of two types. One is called high density cholesterol, <clears throat> high density lipoprotein, which is HDL. One is called low density, LDL. So low density cholesterol is not good for us. It's a bad cholesterol. High density cholesterol is good for the body. So we need high density cholesterol in particular amount and we do not need low density cholesterol, but most of the processed fast foods contains more LDL than HDL, okay? So that's the problem. If LDL or cholesterol's level increases, okay, then it's a problem. What can be the problem? The problem can be that it can just get stuck somewhere and cause myocardial infarctions, at that time, you will need um, clot busters like streptokinase. But before that, if we can, through blood tests, get to know that this person's blood cholesterol is high, then we can give that person statins. Okay, so statins, again, it's produced by another fungi. In this case, it's a yeast. The name is Monascus purpurus. Monascus or purus, purius, actually. So this yeast produces statins, which is used as blood cholesterol lowering agents. Okay. So what, what this or, or molecule does is, it inhibits the enzyme that synthesizes cholesterol. So in our body, whatever we eat through food, so cholesterol is synthesized from 
the nutrients most mostly lipids okay lipids and proteins so if you inhibit the enzyme that is making cholesterol then you can lower the blood cholesterol level but if a normal person takes this it's a problem because you need good cholesterol in your body at one after one point of time where your bad cholesterol is so much that you can you want to now degrade it then you use statins so it should not be taken or should not be given before proper tests and a physician's advice and also the dosage is decided on the basis of how high or low the cholesterol how high the cholesterol is and how much do you want to cut down so it inhibits the enzyme responsible for synthesis of cholesterol so statins lower down blood cholesterol <clears throat> levels okay so all these three streptokinase cyclosporin a statins they are bioactive molecules and then uh, streptokinase is also an enzyme which are commercially synthesized using microorganisms and they are very very important drugs for treatment and in medicine okay any doubts no sir i'll stop here for doubts because all we were talking about is something related to biology now i'll switch to something related to like also the social life there also biology will be a, a part but this was about human more related to the good part so if you have any questions i'll just stop for a minute or two for questions before i go on to the next part anyone wants to ask something <clears throat> So actually, I missed the last part of the previous class. So if you can give me a short intro of that. L yeah, last part of the previous class. This one. Yeah. yeah. So this is what we just finished. So uh, the third part under microbes in industrial products. So we first started with fermenting microbes, which are Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the major one. And we talked about bread and alcohol in that. Second, we talked about antibiotic, which is penicillin is the best example that we studied. Okay, there are many more antibiotics, canamycin, amoxicillin, which is again derivatives of penicillin or something uh, entirely different. Then third, we went on to understand chemicals and enzyme and bioactive molecules producing microbes in which in the last class, the last part I did was chemical producing microbes in which organic acid was the chemical that we were interested in so organic acid mostly these four organic acids acetic acid citric acid lactic acid and butyric acid these four are very very important commercially used organic acids to they are used in like um, food preservatives they are also used in flavoring agents in in some uh, tetra pack juices etc for making cleansing agents these acids are used so acetic acid is produced by acetobacter acetae, which is a bacterium. Citric acid is produced by Aspergillus niger, which is a fungi. Lactic acid by Lactobacillus, another bacterium. And butyric acid by Clostridium butylicum, another bacterium. So these are commercially used on a large scale. So in big, big containers, these bacteria or fungal populations are grown. And then you allow them to synthesize these acids. And again, you keep because this is acidic acid so after one point of time it will also start affecting the bacterium itself so same thing you can just keep take removing it out titrating it out and keep uh, allow the bacterium or the fungi to keep producing more and more of this acid okay in whatever concentration you need you can take it out and then you can just separate it from the solvent is it clear Aisha? This was the last thing that we did. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. So now let me go to another important part, which uh, which is asked in uh, in board examination or school examination often, which is microbes in sewage treatment. Now, what is sewage? Sewage. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing. Then why do we have sewage? We should not have sewages, right? 
like it's a good thing but also it's a bad thing and like if it's near the house and all sewage goes through your house your house yeah. has a connection to sewage in cities especially especially all cities are built over sewages right so underground is your sewer lines and on on the on uh, above the ground there are roads and houses colonies living so i meant so, to say like especially in delhi you have seen like you have open sewages and all yes so it should always be underground till it reaches a place where it can be treated so sewage we all know because when human live together they live in um, big big cities it's basically the human waste generated from every household that goes through sewage now there is no other option right it's still a good thing that we can contain the waste otherwise um, like before the the culture of having uh, toilets and sewages people used to defecate in open still in rural areas or in underprivileged areas people still defecate in open which uh, is an invitation to many diseases which can be carried by flies and other vectors so sewage helps us to get rid of those diseases but it also has a negative aspect if we cannot contain the sewage water if we cannot treat the sewage water or if the sewage water leaks or we are directly throwing it in the rivers basically it's polluting the fresh water source as well right so the major component of this waste water which is generated by cities and towns people living in cities and towns is the human excreta and human excreta is toxic it has high toxic um, it has how high amount of ammonia and urea okay now this toxic substance is anyways organic matter because it's produced inside the human so in sewage we do not uh, include the industrial waste let's say there is a factory that is making a uh, that is synthesizing any chemical and the by product or the uh, left waste from that factory is another harmful chemical so sometimes people just throw that also in sewage or um, in the rivers so that's illegal that should not be done you have to treat that chemical make it less harmful or remove the harm, uh, harmful substance and then throw the solvent in sewage or what or, or rivers same with with sewage sewers we have to treat it because it contains a lots and lots of organic matter and microbes feeding on that organic matter and many of these microbes can be pathogenic disease causing pathogenic means disease causing causing and since there is tons and tons of liters of sewage produced every day from every even a small city we we just know what amount of pathogenic load we are talking about you can just imagine so it's very important to have sewage treatment plants so what do sewage treatment plants do is that they take the sewage water and take it through a series of treatments which includes biological microbial treatment as well to make this less harmful or less polluting which is safe to be dumped in the rivers or the ocean is it clear everyone so that is it does not affect the it does not affect the flora and fauna there it does not kill the ecosystem so in right down so what happens is uh, you have sewage which is mostly majorly it is contains human excreta and toilet waste now this sewage goes to sewage treatment plants now if you understand the logic of this treatment you may not have to mug it up or remember everything in a series so the sewage treatment plants are called stps in short now what happens in a sewage treatment plant is there are two type of treatments that are done first is called the treatment happens in two stages first is called primary treatment and the secondary treatment now 
<coughs> in this there are two types of treatment or two i should say stages of treatment before going to the microbial treatment the first one is called primary treatment okay now in primary treatment what we do is we know that many uh, a lot of uh, not the major but a significant amount of a significant component of this sewage water is floating waste right floating debris which is which is just not totally mixed with the water so first treatment is called physical treatment okay so it's obvious like if you see the logic if a sewer water if you are the head of a sewage treatment plant let's say and you have to devise a plan that how can we make this water which is now the worst kind of water present with pathogenic load lots of bacteria i have to treat it to make it safe to be dumped in the river so first we'll say okay let's do one thing first when the water comes to the sewage treatment plant let collect it in very very large uh, filtration barrels like uh, filtration um, um, uh, compartments and use the process of filtration and sedimentation okay so physical treatment includes two things you allow this water to stand so that sedimentation happens so some things two type of things are immiscible in the water one is which is which have high density and does not get mixed with water one is which has low density and does not get mixed with water yes logically is it true do you understand everyone so yes or no am i am i audible yes sir shall i yeah. ask one thing i think so it's silly but i want to ask yes in india like oh, like we know that in india like everywhere water is there mostly and all but what about here like in saudi arabia mostly deserts are there and factories are out of cities most of deserts are there and sorry i could no no i mean to say in saudi arabia like most of the factories are out of city in the desert place and also ah yes it so yeah it's so you are talking about industrial limits so it's always this there's, there's a there's it it's true for every city even in india the residential complex or the core of a city where the people live where schools hospitals and residential things are there or even offices are there you are not allowed to um, start a factory a chemical factory let's say for that matter in the middle in the heart of the city so that's called something called as industrial limit to every city so in in places like india it sometimes is very difficult to maintain that because when when the limit of one city ends the boundary of the other city begins let's say if you say that delhi ends so where delhi ends the ncr begins faridabad sonipat noida no karnal noida ghaziabad they all begin so then you have to decide that if people are living in if more residential complexes are somewhere then you have to allocate more uh, work or places somewhere and you also have to allocate factories somewhere but in countries where cities are distant from each other and separated by barren lands or lands which are not um, um, fit for living for example the, the example that you gave if you have deserts in between where people are not living it can be utilized as a good space to just set up factories right so that's that's one obvious thing that i can think of so in india also in every country if so it's not like uh, india is densely populated only at regions where uh, basic amenities are there if you go to any country you will see big big chunk of land which is not habitat people are not living there and it's important there are forests there are uh, agricultural lands there are just barren lands and then a city will start and you will see all the houses shops roads everything just starts so it's always there it's it's the same for every country everywhere 
It's okay, Aisha? Yes, sir. Thank you. So the first thing coming back to the sewage treatment plants for every city, wherever it is, the first treatment is physical treatment. So things which are heavier than the water and can sediment you if you allow the water to stand for some time, sometime means for days you allow it to stand, heavier things will sediment down and lighter things will keep floating. So you can use a sieve and can filter out the things which are floating, a big sieve in that big chamber or you can just allow things to sediment and whatever is left between sedimented and uh, filtered thing is known as your effluent, okay? So write down, smaller, large and small particles are physically removed. Large and small particles <clears throat> are physically removed from the sewage water, from the sewage water, through sedimentation or filtration. Okay. Now, everything that settles, all the solid waste that settles, including human excreta, soil, etc., it makes the primary sludge. Okay. So let's say this is a big chamber where sewage water is collected. Okay. So at the base, there will be a dense settlement. A lot of things will settle. Correct? So this part is called effluent, the liquid. And this is called primary sludge. Okay. Effluent is also known as supernatant. Now this is the water. So we cannot throw this in reverse. This is what we wanted to separate. We did that. And it's called sludge because it's a sludgy material. Anyone has seen uh, grease or something like that? A sludgy substance. Anyone has seen any? The gooey substance, like a like a glue, like like uh, grease. Yes, kind of. Yes. So that's primary sludge is that containing all uh, most of harmful things. In the effluent, we still have harmful pathogenic bacteria because they will not settle easily. They are they can be present in the water. So this effluent is taken for another series of settling tanks. These are also called secondary tanks. Settling, okay, let me write it more. <clears throat> <coughs> settling tanks or secondary tanks for the secondary treatment. This is where most of the biological treatment starts. So primary treatment is clear to you. It was simple. The logic was to separate solid from the water. Okay. Is it okay, everyone? Clear? Yes, it's Yes, sir. Now, secondary treatment, or as I called it, it's also known as the biological treatment. This is where we will now use microbes. So they are also counted as good microbes. Though they are not good microbes for us, we cannot use it for food, but they, are, they become good microbes because they are doing the dirty job for us, right? Yeah, so... They are doing the dirty job for us. They are good for us. We can utilize them. And they are the good microbes. So what happens in this is this effluent that came from the primary effluent that came from the primary treatment, we put primary effluent into big containers. Again, store it. The second series of containers, the settling tanks. And 
we do aeration. Now, why are we doing aeration? The concept is to begin with, what do you think? The sewage water, will it have, uh, what, if, what will be the dissolved oxygen in this water? You know about dissolved oxygen? Every water has some dissolved oxygen. If a water is stagnating, if a water is not fit for drinking and is not healthy water, the dissolved oxygen gets down. If a water is toxic, the dissolved oxygen will be low. In this case, because it in sewer, lots and lots of harmful anaerobic bacteria are growing. So the, so the water or this primary effluent is very, very anaerobic. So we start um, mixing air in it. Just like uh, with, the, with the help of pumps, you, you keep, anyone of you have seen aquarium? In aquarium, we'll keep, we keep making the water aerated. So there's a pump at the base, which keeps uh, putting air bubbles in it, in the water. Have you ever thought, why are we doing that? To keep, to keep it fresh. Keep what fresh? Water. But we also change the water after two, three weeks. Or, um, why do we do that? If we are keeping the water fresh by putting air, why are we changing the water then? Simple, it's logical. I know the answer. I know, the answer. It's not oh, I, know. I, I know you know the answer, but oh, and if you know an answer and if you cannot give it, it's as good as not knowing the answer. So a weapon not used is a weapon not possessed. <laughs> or a skill not used is a skill not possessed. Weapon, weapon is very violent a term, so let's shift to skill. <laughs> Forget about the weapon. Anyone? Anyone? No one has an aquarium? <clears throat> yes, Shaheen. Yes, Shaheen, your voice was breaking. I could not hear you properly. Can you, can you give the answer again? Add oxygen in the water. So for that, we are doing aeration, right? Yes. Why are we changing the water? Because it's... Mm -hmm. Spoiled. How? Because it's been in the tank for weeks. So the water bottle that you buy from market, the water has been there in that bottle for months, but you still buy it and drink water from that. Uh, is it because like there will be less oxygen in the But we tank? are aerating, no? We are aerating the tanks. You forgot one way, very important. You are all are thinking in one direction. What, what is there in the aquarium? In the water? Fish. Fish, fish is a living organism, right? Yeah. We can only increase the oxygen concentration or dissolved and oxygen. By the, uh, by the bubbles, right? Sorry? It's done by that bubbles that are present in water. It's done. What is done? Uh, what is done by that bubble thing? I know, but I don't know. So by the, by the bubble thing, what you're doing is you are by bubbling in the water, you are making the water, you are in increasing the dissolved oxygen in the water. That's true. But the fish, which is constantly living in the water, will breathe in that oxygen, will eat the food. We also give food in the aquarium. But the fish will also excrete, right, in the water. It's not like you have separately made an attached washroom for the fish. They excrete in the aquarium water itself. So over time, the aquarium water, because it's not flowing water, it is a, it is a stationary water, it gets, it gets more and more concentrated with the animal waste, right? That's why we change it. Do you understand everyone? Yes. Or we dilute it. It's simple. So you do not forget what are we, what is the aquarium serving a purpose for? So a good way is if you do not want to change all the water, which you should not change because taking fish out of water and keeping it in some very less amount of water and then changing the whole water 
that is also required but once in a very long time to get rid of algae that starts growing in the water on that glass that's also done but normally what you can do is you can dilute it so take three fourth of the water and add fresh three fourth so everything gets diluted to a very safe level okay that's more easier to do now similarly in this one now we don't have fish here but we have bacteria lots and lots of harmful bacteria so first we start aeration in the primary effluent now what will this aeration do this aeration will increase the amount of oxygen and when oxygen will increase what will also primary effluent aerobic bacteria will increase right because aerobic bacteria needs oxygen to survive before that in the absence of oxygen there were only anaerobic bacteria living correct yes yeah so so we did aeration which is a physical process okay still the biological process has not started but because of this physical process this aerobic bacteria increases in the effluent now the biological process starts this aerobic bacteria which is increasing why are we making these bacteria increase because there is lots and lots of thing organic matter in that effluent which we want to de degrade now this aerobic bacteria when it will increase in number it will also need food right so while growing they will consume the organic matter the waste basically ammonia urea in the effluent and this is exactly what we wanted now when the organic matter will decrease so this will lead to decrease in organic matter <clears throat> and remember that this organic matter is the waste that we are talking about so decrease in organic matter load so now if the organic matter will decrease what will happen because of this the biological oxygen demand sorry biochemical oxygen demand which is called bod anyone has heard of this term biochemical see this is the most confusing part where you select the wrong answer biochemical oxygen demand bod anyone knows what is bod yeah Yes, Asha. What is beauty? Um, one minute, sir. Like basically, the oxygen that is consumed by bacteria and do what? And, uh, for uh, uh, decom like when when they are decom. Yes, yes. You're going. You're going. The correct. organic matter, like oxygen, is present when they are doing this. so aerobic bacteria needs oxygen to do metabolism just like humans we are also aerobic organisms we metabolize the glucose that we eat in the presence of oxygen if you don't give oxygen to a human the human will die because it will not be able to do respiration in the cells which is a metabolic process correct similarly uh bacteria aerobic bacteria also needs oxygen to decompose the organic matter or to digest the organic matter present in a water now bod is that oxygen the amount of oxygen that is required in in given liter of water per liter so i gave you five samples let's say one sample of 1 liter water i took from sewer one sample of 1 liter water i took from a polluted lake around 1 liter i took from a river which is slightly polluted and the other i took from glacier which is very pure water in which do you think the bod will be more and in which do you think the bod will be very less the like the waste water will have more bod right the, the polluted waste water the polluted, polluted water water will yeah. have the most polluted one which is from the sewer will have the most bod yes right so bod is oxygen demand 
so the demand is more when the supply is less simple rule right or the availability is less that's where the demand increases when the availability for vaccines were less the demand were more when the availability for um, oxygen cylinders were less the demand was more during covid you understand it's inversely proportional so the availability of oxygen in a polluted water is very less so this demand of oxygen will be very high so this is the amount of oxygen you can write down bod refers to the amount of oxygen bod refers to the amount of oxygen required by the aerobic bacteria required by the aerobic bacteria to oxidize all the organic matter oxidize all the organic matter present per liter of water to oxidize all the organic matter present in 1 liter of water or per liter of water is it clear that's bod so when we are doing aeration the aerobic bacteria is increasing now when they are increasing they will start consuming the organic matter when they will start consuming the organic matter there will be less less and less organic matter left so the bod will increase or decrease by this process people the bod will increase or decrease 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 you understand why it will decrease because the organic matter is decreasing because aerobic bacteria are already eating it up and the oxygen will be will increase because we are constantly aerating it okay so this significantly reduces and how can you test it you can just take slight sample from that water and check for the oxygen concentration dissolved oxygen do it's called do so there's a test to figure out dissolved oxygen and if you see that in a given sample of water the dissolved oxygen is more which means the bod is less which means the water is less polluted if the bod is more and the dissolved oxygen is less and the water is more polluted okay yes, so this we do till the bod decreases to a level where it is safe so the greater the bod more polluting potential is there in that water okay so when it is once it is uh, significantly reduced then what we do is this aerobic bacteria will keep growing till there is organic matter to consume right but after one point of time the organic matter will start decreasing and the uh, number of aerobic bacteria will keep increasing so do you think it will keep increasing forever can the number of aerobic bacteria if i keep aerating the effluent will it keep increasing no because after one point of time what they are feeding on will decrease so they will saturate and then they will start dying and it's important so these aerobic bacteria when they grow they start forming group like um um what do we call it masses masses of bacterial associations mesh like structure that is called flocks okay so they produce flocks now flocks are big masses mesh like network of aerobic bacteria 
So after we have decreased the BOD to a very safe level, what do we what do we, do we want to do now? Now we want these flocks to die, right? Or we want to remove these flocks. So what we will do? These flocks are big, large mesh-like networks of bacteria. Now, when the bacteria was less in number, it was freely floating in the water. But if the bacteria becomes so high, the bacterial number becomes so high that they attach to each other and make bigger particles called flocks. If you now stop aerating, when you know that the BOD is decreased, the purpose of our aerobic bacteria is fulfilled. We do not want them any longer. So what we will do is we will stop aeration and we will let the water settle. So now when it will settle, all these flocks will settle down at the bottom. Is it clear? So after this, yes. you allow the effluent to settle. Now, what happens is flocks sediment down. It is called flock sedimentation step. Now we do not need an, um, bacteria anymore. Once it sediments, this is known as secondary sludge or activated sludge. Remember there was a primary sludge as well? Yes, sir. But this is called secondary sludge or activated sludge. This is a very useful substance because this can act as an inoculum. This can act as the drop of dahi that we put in milk to make more dahi. So next time, a fraction of this secondary sludge, we can directly add into the primary effluent and start doing aeration so that we do not have to grow the bacteria from the scratch into that aeration tanks, right? So a fraction of the secondary sludge, it is called activated because it goes back into the primary effluent. And where do the remaining part goes? The remaining part, okay? So this effluent goes into, sorry, um, the effluent, after the flock sedimentation, where does the effluent go? it can be released in river or whatever because it's safe now. Do you understand everyone? But this secondary sludge has lots and lots of aerobic bacteria. We will only use a fraction of it to pump it back into the primary effluent as an inoculum. But where will the rest of the part goes? So a major part of this has to be degraded because it, it's harmful. Major fraction of secondary sludge is pumped into sludge digesters, anaerobic sludge digesters because we cannot forever keep making aerobic bacteria and store it, we cannot store them. So we have to finally kill them also. You know? We just want our benefit. We will take whatever is required, put it back in primary inoculum, do the process of aeration, everything again. And the major part, we don't need it now. So we will put it into sludge digesters. And as the name suggests, in these sludge digesters, there are anaerobic bacteria which will start killing and eating these bacteria. Okay, so write down. In anaerobic sludge digester, in anaerobic sludge digester, anaerobic bacteria digest, kill and digest, kill and digest the 
aerobic bacteria. And if there is any fungus, that also. And in the process, what happens is when they would digest something, they will also produce some waste. But this time, the waste which is produced is gaseous. So these, during the digestion, these anaerobic bacteria produce biogas. So we have one advantage. We cleaned the sewer water, we treated the sewage water, and side by side, we also got a useful product which is called a biogas. So you know what is a biogas? Biogas is a mixture of methane, hydrogen sulfide, which is H2S. Remember which gases are there? So methane is CH4. This is H2S and carbon dioxide. You all know what is carbon dioxide, right? Carbon dioxide is very less, yeah. but it is there. CO2. So these three gases make the biogas together. And this biogas can be used as a source of energy. So for rural areas, this connection in India is known as this gas availability is called gober gas because it's also, it can also be separately produced from dung, cow dung, which is gober. So it's a fuel source. So we got something useful from the whole process. Is the process clear? Everyone? Let's go back and let me tell you again. So we all started with here, microbes in sewage treatment. Now pay attention. We have sewage to begin with, a major problem, what to do? but it majorly contains human excreta and toilet waste. So we send the sewage through the sewers to the sewage treatment plant, STPs, where we start the first stage of treatment. So there are two stages. First is primary treatment. Primary treatment is simply physical treatment by which things that settle down or things that keep floating, we just take that out. So things that settle down are called primary sludge. Things that keep floating is effluent. If it, it has a solid, we can just filter it out through a sieve and this primary sludge is then removed. You can bury it in the soil or because it, it is mostly soil, or, uh, stones and all the human excreta which got settled, settled down. Now it can act as a manure or just put it in the ground. Rest, we take the effluent and send it for secondary treatment. This is the second stage of treatment, which is also known as biological treatment. Here, this primary effluent that has come for the secondary treatment, we start putting air inside it. This process is called aeration. And because of the process of aeration, aerobic bacteria starts growing up because we have added some inoculum. Remember, this I did not tell you here, but now you know that this part, some fraction from here will come and go here, right? You understand? From the activated sludge, everyone? Yes. So you just had to make it once. After that, every plant just reuses it. So we put some aerobic bacteria, we start aeration, so their number increases. As their number increases, they start consuming all the organic matter in the effluent, and they start growing in number, and they start producing flocks, large mesh-like network of these bacteria. So when they consume all the organic matter or almost almost all the organic matter, the organic matter load decreases and also the biochemical oxygen demand decreases and this makes the water safe, the effluent safe. So we allow the effluent to settle and the flocks will sediment because they are now large mesh-like networks. So most of them will sediment and whatever is the effluent, which is here called the secondary effluent, or the safe effluent is released in the river. Now this flock which has sedimented is collected and is called secondary sludge or activated sludge. A part of it goes back and act as an aerobic bacteria inoculum, but major fraction of secondary sludge has to be, 
has to be digested. So we use anaerobic sludge digesters where anaerobic bacteria kill and digest this aerobic bacteria and fungi and in the process produce biogas for us, which is useful, which is, can be used as a fuel. And this is the whole process. Now, no one of you asked, what happens to these aerobic bacteria? We are also growing them, right? Sorry, these anaerobic bacteria. So these anaerobic bacteria, when they kill and digest the aerobic bacteria and produce biogas, they are increasing. So what to do with them? Just put them back here in the primary effluent and start doing aeration. Because if you start giving oxygen, these anaerobic bacteria will not survive. They cannot tolerate oxygen. So to kill anaerobic bacteria, we just need to provide oxygen. And to kill aerobic bacteria, we need to provide another, more anaerobic bacteria. So you see it's a feed loop cycle where one thing we are producing is being utilized in one step, another thing is being utilized at another step. Make sense everyone? So this anaerobic bacteria goes back to the primary effluent and again aeration starts. And they get killed and aerobic bacteria gets uh, start rising. Is this process clear or and there's a confusion? So we have last two minutes left. So I'll stop here for questions if you have any questions. Any question or is it all clear? Clear, sir. Clear? Shaheen, you have a question? Sir, I'm confused where is aerobic and where anaerobic is used. Anaerobic is already present in primary effluent because it is coming from this physical treatment of the sewer. So this is basically the sewage water only. It already contains lots of anaerobic. To kill anaerobic, you just need to give oxygen. So they cannot tolerate oxygen. It's like a toxic thing to them. So they die. And we have put aerobic bacteria to increase the uh, amount of oxygen and to consume all the organic matter. So this is where aerobic bacteria is used, which is coming from the secondary sludge. So as aerobic bacteria increases, anaerobic decreases. And after one point of time, when the water is safe, we release it in the rivers. And now we want these aerobic bacteria also to die. We cannot just keep producing bacteria. no. So we sediment these aerobic bacteria and send it to a secondary sludge digester here, which is the anaerobic sludge digester, where we now give some anaerobic bacteria to kill and digest the aerobic bacteria and produce biogas for us. So our aerobic bacteria were used and now we are killing it. This is sorted. Now this anaerobic bacteria, which will now increase, can again go back to this primary effluent. And again, we can do aeration and kill them also. Or you can just kill them here also, just by putting air in that hole aeration of the whole thing. Is it clear, Shaheen? Yes, it's clear now. Okay, very good. Thank you. So I'll, I'll see you all in the next class. And your homework is you have to go and read the microbes in the production of biogas. I just told you where the biogas produces. We will focus a little bit on this process in the next class in detail. Okay, so your homework is you have to figure out what is a biogas plant and uh, how bacteria are used there. Okay, so I'll see you all in the next class. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank you, children. Thank you, sir. Bye -bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Remember my audible. Yes, sir. So, in the last class, uh, do you have any doubt from the no, previous sir. class? Okay, just wait for a minute. Uh, I mean, we'll join soon. Okay, sir.
Mm-hmm. 